Hello, and welcome to this brand new video series where I'm gonna be teaching you Mari from start to finish. So if you're a beginner that's never used it and you've always wanted to dive in, this is the video series for you. Now I know what you're thinking, who's this rando on the internet that thinks he has the authority to teach me this incredibly complex piece of software? Well, my name is Michael Wilde. If you're new to this channel, I'm a visual effects artist of over seven years and I've done texturing with Mari and Substance on multiple films, including Fantastic Beasts, Elite of Battle Angel, uh, Detective Pikachu, just to name a few. And I've also taught Mari at uni. So yeah, we're just gonna go through it all in this video series and hopefully by the end, you will know how to use this software. So at the moment we're looking at a camera that I've previously textured. Just a full disclaimer, this video is not learning about how to texture an asset. This is a video series about learning how to understand and use the software. If you want texturing tutorials, then I've got them. I've got this camera, I've got the creature tutorial series that I did already. All that jazz is already on my YouTube, so check that out. Yeah, and jump on the Discord whilst you're at it, why not? Cool, so first things first, we are going to make a new project because Mari works with projects. So I'm gonna close this camera. So I'm gonna go along to the projects tab and I'm gonna make a new one. So you can either create a new one by clicking new here or you can right click and go new. So I'm gonna do that. And that's gonna bring up this project UI. Cool, so I'm gonna call this Mari Learning. And I'm gonna select the path of my geometry. So here, under geometry, I'm just gonna paste in the path I want and I'm gonna click this object that I want. So Mari has to have an object to get started. That's the only thing that you need. Then underneath here, it's gonna bring up some mesh options. I don't want to change any of these because the defaults are absolutely fine. Under channels, we've got another tab here called channels. This will by default set up some base channels for us that I don't want. We've got base color, we've got specular, we've got roughness, they're ticks, so they're gonna be made. Really, I don't need them, but you know what? I'm just gonna keep them there so I can show you what it makes. We can delete them later on. We can absolutely add new ones later on. That's how I'd usually do it. We'll just leave it for now. Color settings, we're not gonna to touch this. Color space, it's a whole nother issue. We're not gonna be touching it in the first part of a learning this already quite complex piece of software. Um, so we're just gonna leave this, so I would ignore this. And lighting, so this sets up the default lighting or the base lighting in your scene. Again, I don't need to touch it because we can change this all later on, but it's just good to know that it's there so that you know you don't have to worry about it. I don't know why they throw it all on you when you first start, but they do. So all you need to do is just add your geometry and then we're gonna go create a new project. And it's gonna think about it. It might take a while. Uh, this is not the first time I've made this project today. Um, it's taken a few, we've done a few takes, we've done a few takes, cool. So by default, it has brought in my object. So we're looking at it right there. And what I'm gonna do is, I already did it earlier, but just to double check is I'm gonna reset my viewport. So I'm seeing exactly what you're seeing if you're loading Mari for the first time. So I'm gonna go to view and default layout and that should do it. And is Mari gonna crash? Cause it crashed earlier. Cool, so I've got Mari back alive and we now have our object inside of Mari. Great, but before we touch anything in this UI, I just wanna quickly explain what's going on when you're creating a project. So why am I creating a project? If I go up to file save, there's no file save as, where's that? That's in every other program. Well, Mari likes to work a little bit differently. So Mari uses this thing called projects. And if I go along to this project menu, you'll see other ones that I've got. Some I'm gonna have to blur out because of NDAs, but, um, you'll see I've got all these other projects. When you first start Mari, you're not gonna have any of these because you haven't made any yet. If I wanna, for example, export this project or send it to somebody else, I can't just do that because the way that Mari saves its files, it just lives on your hard drive, not as an individual file or just lives out there in the ether. That's kind of how I think about it. And then if I wanna send that to somebody or if I wanna transfer it to a different computer or if I'm at work and I need to give it to another artist, then what you have to do is you have to archive. So to archive, you right click and you can go to archive or down here, you can click archive. And what that does is it basically saves it as a file that you can then give to other people. So say for example, you have downloaded my camera files from Gumroad, then the only way to open up those is to open up the archive, which I provided because that's the only way I can give that file to somebody else on a different computer. So what I can do is I can just go to my desktop, save this as an archive somewhere, and then that's gonna do it. If it's a big file, it might take a while. And then I can right click and go open archive and then find that or find whichever one somebody gives me. And then let's just open a random one. Avocado for Mari, so it's a copy of that. And now I've got it there. So if I wanna delete that, because I do, I don't want two of it, I can just go delete and now it's deleted it. Cool. And that's how Mari works with its scene files. So it's just good to know. I always archive as often as I can to back things up because if my computer crashes and I don't have it archived, who knows what's gonna happen? So I like to just archive them, back them up on a hard drive. When I was at NPC, they told us to archive a version every single day so that we didn't lose work because you can lose work from it. Cool, so I'm gonna jump back into this project by double clicking it. So before we start navigating all the UI and all the buttons that we've got going on, let's talk about navigating the 3D space and our object. So if we have a look at my object here, then how do we, Look at that, how am I rotating? So first things first, and this is really important because I've had a few people ask me this. What we're gonna do is we're gonna go up to edit preferences 
and then on navigation, I do this every single time I start up a new Mari on a different computer. If I'm at work, my preferences have been deleted. And under general, we've got this control type. And by default, it'll be set to Mari. I always change it to Maya. If you're using a different 3D package, obviously change it to that. But that just means that um, I don't get weird rotation on the camera, which Mari has by default, which I really don't like. And it just works for me. So these shortcuts that I'm about to give, I don't know if they're the Maya control type specific, but they are the shortcuts that I use. So I'm going to give them. If they're incorrect, then you can just look for your specific control type on Google. But Alt and left click rotates around your model. Alt and middle mouse pans. And Alt and right click zooms in and out. Great, so that's how you can look at your model. And then say, for example, I've panned it off screen and I've forgotten where it is. I can hit F and that will reframe it for me. Great. And then the number keys on the keyboard, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, just six, just up to six, will rotate the mesh. We've got some predefined camera moves. So for example, they're always the same, no matter which key I press. And you can just jump around quickly there and look in different views. So that's really useful. Cool, so that's the 3D space in Mari. Let's talk about the 2D space. We've got a lot of buttons looking at us. Mari is a really complex piece of software. I don't know how many times I've said that and I don't know how many times I'm gonna say that over the course of this series. But in this first one, we're just gonna look at briefly at the UI and a few buttons here and there. And then in the next lesson, we're gonna talk more specifically about these tools here on the left. And we're gonna talk about palettes on the right because they require a bit more in-depth looking at. And I don't want any of these videos to be too long by themselves because I don't want people to get bored and not retain the information. So I'm gonna split them up specifically to avoid that. So let's talk about some bits of the UI. So like I said, on the left here, we've got all of our tools. If you're familiar with Photoshop or anything like that, then this won't be particularly daunting to you. You will notice that some do have a little drop down icon so I can click and that will show me more options. That isn't just for the tools. Underneath here, we've got some other options which have the same thing. So if you see that little arrow, then that just means there's other options. I'm using Mari 4.6 v3, I think. So um, I don't think that's in every single Mari version. I think it's only in the newer ones because if you're using it on a laptop, I think they just wanted to make the working space in the 3D a little bit bigger for you. So they've done that. I personally don't love it because I liked before where I could see all my tools at once, but that's neither here nor there. Cool, so we've got those. We're gonna go through some of these buttons in a little bit more depth in a second. At the top, we've got our normal kind of drop down menus that you'd see in a lot of 3D programs or any programs really. It's worth mentioning, I'm not really gonna talk about these because a lot of these buttons do double up. So for example, if I look here, we've got a shading button and I can change my shading from full to flat. But here, I can also do that on the left-hand side. I can change it back from flat to full. So I don't use these all the time because these buttons do double up. So we're not gonna talk a huge amount about this. This filters menu is slightly different because there is nowhere else that I'm aware of that you can use these. So if you're ever wanting to do a filter, on a node or on an image, then you would come to this filter menu. And there are some other ones, but we're not gonna touch in them on too much detail at the moment. On the top left, we've got, we can save our project and undo. Again, we can do all of this from the file and the edit drop down, so nothing major. Then this menu to the right of that, this is all very context sensitive. So depending on the tool you're currently using, these options will change. So at the moment, I've got the selection tool. If I change to the paint tool, you'll see all these options change and I can change the radius of my paintbrush. So at the moment it's 30 and I can set that to 600 if I want. Um, again, we're gonna to touch on tools properly in the next one. I just wanna make you aware of what's going on. Next to that, we've got some options like I can turn on wireframe. So next to the wireframe options, I've got some camera options. So let's talk about cameras. So at the moment, you might notice my model looks quite flat and you might be thinking, hey, Michael, you're not a great sculptor. It looks weird. Well, that's because we're using the orthographic camera and I'm not a great sculptor. If you don't know what an orthographic camera is, it basically just flattens it. There's absolutely no perspective to it. Obviously our eyes see with perspective, but things like technical blueprints and drawings don't have perspective to them. So that's what an orthographic camera kind of replicates. However, we've got Next to it, we've got this tab for the perspective camera. So if I click that, you will see that suddenly this face looks a fair bit better. So I'm gonna hit five on my keyboard and that's a preset view. And then I'm going to jump back to orthographic and I'm gonna press five again. And we can just switch between these two and you can see how different that camera is. Why is this important? Well, when you're projecting textures and reference, sometimes you will wanna be in perspective or you'll wanna be in orthographic to either add or remove distortion when you're projecting. We're not gonna talk about that hugely more until we get onto the actual projecting video but it's worth knowing. And then next to that, we've got an orthographic and UV view. So this is split. So on one side, we've got our orthographic and on the other side, we've got our UVs. So, so if I select this UV patch, so patches is what Mari calls a UV tile, then you'll see it selects all the faces that are on that. Ignore the crappy UVs, it's because I use ZBrush to do it really quickly. And then we've got our 1002 UDIM, 
and we've got a 1003 UDIM. So why would I want to look at the orthographic and the UVs at the same time? Well, purely because if you want to paint on the UVs, it can be really handy to see how it's looking in 3D and vice versa to make sure that there's no distortion or anything like that. So this is actually one of the handiest views. And I find that while I'm often switching between these two, I'll often land on the orthographic and the UV view split. We can also see just the UV view if we want. So clicking that here and we can see that. So these buttons that I mentioned earlier, these are to do with cameras. So what we can do is we can click this to change our view. So if I'm in the ortho UV view and I click here, then what I can do is I can change this, for example, to change it to a orthographic camera. I can click perspective or I can change it back to UVs by clicking this one here. And if I hop back to the perspective, you'll see I've got options here and they're only viewable when I'm in the perspective. If I go to orthographic, they go away. And this basically just lets me change the field of view of this perspective camera. So I'm gonna pop that back to default. Cool, so that's the top bar. On the left-hand side underneath our tools, which again, I'm gonna to touch in the next video in a bit more depth, we've got some options here in orange. So we've got our selection mode. And this basically means I can switch between selecting the whole object between the different patches or the UDIMs or the UV tiles or different faces of the object. So with my selection mode, what I can do is click that. And now because I'm on face mode, it's only selecting the entire face. But if I change it back to patch, then we're on the entire patch is now selected. And you can tell that by the green outline. Underneath that, we've got a menu which has been made somewhat redundant with the use of nodes. In this video series, I'm not really gonna to touch on layers. I'm only gonna be texturing in nodes because to me, they're so much better than layers. I haven't used layers in years now. When I moved to MPC and learnt nodes, I haven't touched them since. So we're not really gonna to touch this, but if you're using layers and you can use this menu here to switch between just viewing a layer, viewing the entire channel or viewing the shader, but with nodes, you do that a bit more on the fly. Underneath that, we've got the lighting model of our 3D view. So at the moment it's set to full and that means we see some shadows and we see specular. I can click flat and that will just show me the color values. I can change it to basic and that will show me some shadow and then I can switch it back to full and that brings back in the specular. Like I said, if I go up to shading here, I can do that all from here. So there is some double up as you're going around. Underneath that, we've got mirroring options. Not really important until we touch on painting, but it's just good to know that they're there. And then underneath that, I've got an option to clear the paint buffer and an option to reset the paint buffer. I'm not going to talk about paint buffers until we get to the paint buffer lesson. What is the paint buffer? Well, it's basically the way that Mari paints onto its objects. Unlike other texturing pieces of software like Substance, you don't paint directly onto the mesh. There is kind of a step in between and it's one of the most difficult concepts to get your head around when you first learn Mari. I know that was absolutely the case for me. So I'm not gonna to touch on it now, but I just wanna make you aware of what this thing called the paint buffer is. You're probably gonna hear about it a little bit more until we actually address it. So don't get scared if you don't know what it means because I just wanna make sure that you're starting to hear this term and you're getting used to it because when it does sneak up on you, it's this big old elephant in the room and I don't want you to be completely blindsided by it. So it's just worth knowing that we've got some buttons for it here. At the very bottom, we've got some options to, you can basically disable different types of navigation in the 3D viewport. So for example, at the moment, panel is enabled. I can disable the panning for some reason. And then that alt and middle mouse button shortcut I was telling you about earlier, no longer works. I honestly don't know why you do this. It's probably useful in some niche situations, but yeah, these are not really options that I use in general, but it's worth noting that they are there in case for some reason you might want to. Next to that, we've got this button here. And if I turn this off and on, you're gonna see a change on the mesh. What is this button? Well, we're gonna talk about it a bit more later on, but this is the color transform. And it's basically to do with how Mari interprets and displays color space. Again, a bit more of a complex topic than I wanna be touching in episode one of this video tutorial series, but it's just worth mentioning that it's there. Color space, woo, cool. So at the bottom right, we've got some other options here. We've got, for example, this is showing the disk cache. And if you have a UDIM selected, I think that shows there. We've also got some other warnings and other buttons that again, aren't really lesson one introducing yourself into Mari learning, but worth mentioning that there. So the last bits to mention are these things that I haven't talked about on the right hand side. What are all these? These are called palettes and it's basically a whole set of menus and the stuff that you'll be using on a daily basis when it becomes to texturing objects inside of Mari. So if you want to import image reference or you want to change your object out for something else or stuff like that, then that's all done inside of here. So you can see if I close this, I can, this is closing all the palettes and I can click here and open some new ones. 
So we're gonna talk about all the palettes and the tools in a later lesson. The next one is actually gonna be about the paint buffer because I wanna address it before we get onto the tools because the two are so intrinsically linked. Uh, but yeah, join me in the next episode for that. I have been Michael Wilde. If you've got any questions, then feel free to leave them as a comment and I can get back to you or head over to the Discord and send me a message one-on-one -on -one, or people are sharing their work and stuff like that on there if you want feedback on anything that you're working on, stuff like that. Check it out. Yeah, it's a cool little space. Anyway, I've been Michael. Bye.